some of these. So let me introduce our speaker tonight. Um, again, I mean, you guys all know Poe, that's why you're here, but he's the tech columnist for the New York Times, contributor to Science of America, and host of Nova Science Now, premiering tomorrow night, as a matter of fact, on PBS, Channel 13, with Making Stuff 2, Colder, Faster, Safer, Wilder, David Poe. Right. You guys organize like a group outing to go see Gravity? <laughs> we should. We have one. Totally should. I tried it. It was so what else would we get? was do? Anyway, uh, great to see you guys. This is just so cool for me because um, I live one block away. Really? Me being Whisperer! <laughs> like Woody Lane, like right there. Even taking the bike would have been too much fun. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm not a scientist, um, but I very much play one on TV. And I'm going to tell you that story. Um, I got that picture off of Google Images thinking that it would convey impact and power and drama. And now I realize it just makes me look like the cover of Dianetics. <laughs> anyway, so, so I've been writing about technology for 25 years. And, um, and my, my science TV career began about four years ago um, when the National Science Foundation, your tax dollars at work, gave a grant to NOVA, which is the second longest running TV show in American history. 41 years this science show has been going. That's second only to General Hospital, no comment. Um, yes, it's been running continuously for 41 years. Um, and the National Science Foundation and NOVA have a similar mission, which is to bring science to average people, explain what's going on at the cutting edges. And it's an important mission, because I guess you've read that 50% uh, of Americans don't believe that, um, in, in the evolution theory, 40% uh, don't believe in global warming, and an incredible 35% believe that man and dinosaurs coexisted. Um, too, too many episodes of the Flintstones. Right. Anyway, <laughs> so anyway, the National Science Foundation gave Nova a three million dollar grant in 2001 to make a mini series about material science. I hadn't heard of it either. Um, neither had the head of Nova. So we looked it up on Wikipedia, the source of all good information. It says, this scientific field investigates the relationship between the structure of materials at atomic molecular scales and their macroscopic properties. A mini-series? Really? Oh my god, five minutes of that would be too boring. So the grant sat there in the drawer for nine years. Nova did not make this show because they found it, they considered it unfilmable. So finally in 2010, as the grant was about to expire, uh, Nova hired this guy, Chris Schmidt, he's an outside producer, now one of my best friends, totally genius savant, and he said, well, you could make this show, but it would have to break like every rule of Nova. So, uh, first of all, we'd have a host. Now, Nova doesn't have a host. There, there's no Nova host. There's, there's narration, but there's no consistent on-air presence. Um, second of all, he said it would be a non-scientist, um, and that raised some eyebrows. He's like, yeah, yeah, like, like somebody representing the audience will send him in to interview the scientists and, and he'll be, you know, curious and funny and, and sort of make it entertaining. And he said to me that he has used, he used to work for Discovery and National Geographic, and he said that he has used hosts in the past who were scientists, but the trouble is you send a scientist in to interview a scientist and they kind of get in a pissing match. You know, they try to out-jargon each other. Before you know it, nobody can watch the show. So this is how we made the show. This was the ad for it. Like, kind of like a cross between Charlton Heston and Stephen Colbert there. Um, the show is called Making Stuff, and the episodes are called Making Stuff Smarter, Making Stuff Stronger, Cleaner, and Smaller. Again, about material science. So the, the general premise of the show is they would throw me into telegenic, preferably dangerous situations, and film me illustrating the scientific point. So to talk about shark skin, I went diving with three sharks in the Bahamas. Um, that's me on the right. You might wonder why my hands are under my armpits. And it's because the, our scientist here told me that she would be attracting the sharks by waving bloody fish guts in the water. And that if I also waved my arms around, they might think that I had some chum too. And they would, so that's where I was like, <laughs> really scary. Um, 
So to talk about tensile strength of steel, we spent a weekend on a nuclear aircraft carrier. I went hang gliding. Um, we did a, a, <laughs> a segment on the fact that there used to be four kinds of humans. There were Neanderthals, also known as cavemen, and our ancestors, and then two others. Now, three of the four have died out. We're the only ones left. But there used to be four species of humanoids. So when they unraveled the genome a few years ago, they discovered something shocking and horrifying. In our genes, there is between 2 and 6% Neanderthal DNA. Now, there's only one way it could have gotten there. Our ancestors and the Neanderthals hooked up. So, to, to make the point that Neanderthals still walk among us, they hired a, a Hollywood makeup artist to make me up as a Neanderthal. And um, there's, a, there's a result. I, I spent, they wanted me to walk, spend the day walking through San Francisco, uh, you know, filming people's reactions about a Neanderthal walking. And I'm sure you see the punchline of this coming. It was San Francisco! <laughs> Nobody paid any attention! Like, yeah, you know, like this? Okay, whatever. So, this is, at the end of the day, they had me playing cocktail piano at the, at the top of the city in the restaurant there. And it didn't make the show. It was a great, great scene. But anyway, I love this guy. He's like, hey, pal, can I finish my prime rib here? <laughs> what was the connection to material science? Oh, I'm sorry. So this is not part of the no, Very good question. So, so yeah. So there's making stuff about material science for one-hour episodes, and it got incredible ratings. I mean, this this bastard child show that people thought was unfilmable, that it sat in a drawer for nine years, got the highest ratings in seven years, and made everybody excited about doing more making stuff shows. We're getting to that, but because it's public television, there's no ads. Um, it's all begging for money from the government and viewers like you and rich people. So um, we, they immediately started making, trying to get the money together for four more making stuffs, but that takes a year, year and a half to get that money together. So in the meantime, I made a two-hour special about the elements for Nova, same team, same guy, me, same group, and then a six-part miniseries for Nova Science Now last October, and those were on various scientific topics like um, the Neanderthal question and do, an do animals have feelings and uh, Einstein's brain and a bunch of individual topics. So that one wasn't for me. Um, so I'm happy to announce that we have just finished a year of filming. 50 scientists and labs we visited, uh, five countries, $3 million down the tubes to bring you Making Stuff 2. And what's really cool is that it airs tomorrow night. Now, to you, it's like reading the TV guy. You're like, oh, there's a show on tomorrow night. But for me, this has been my life for a year. So this is just an amazing, crucial fulcrum of my life tonight, here, now. So thank you for joining this ecstatic moment. So I thought, since, since you're all obviously going to watch the shows, um, uh, especially those of you who have Nielsen boxes, <laughs> do me a favor, watch that show. Um, uh, I thought I would emphasize tonight um, some of the backstage stories and some of the stories that didn't make the show, because uh, no one's ever going to see them otherwise. Um, I'm always reviewing stuff for the New York Times, like cameras. So I've always got a camera with me, and I took a lot of sort of backstage stuff. So we were at Boston Dynamics, um, and this isn't even what they were, we were there to see. <laughs> it was just walking around in the background. <laughs> They're like, what is that? So look at this. It's, there's no top, bottom, front, or back. That's it's, incredible. It's so cute. It just, <laughs> it just spends all day walking around their lab. Um, Boston Dynamics uh, is, was, is profiled on making stuff wilder. This will be the third show of the series. Wilder is a show about biomimicry. So it's about stealing ideas from nature for our own technological purposes. And they are amazing stories, amazing things that our technologists and engineers would struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle with. Can't make it work. Can't make it work. And then they're like, well, let's see, how does the ox do it? Oh, of course, you know, and they solve it. So this is uh, another Boston Dynamics project. This is Alpha Dog or LS3. Wow. Um, 
This thing follows the soldier. It's a military project, obviously. It, it carries 400 pounds of the soldier's stuff by, with this LIDAR array. It's following him. And the, it's modeled on a horse. Look, it has actual hooves. And unlike any other walking robot, this thing can slip. You'll see it's on wet, steep, uneven terrain right now. You'll see the front right foot slip on a rock in just a minute and totally catch itself right there. Oh, no, it's totally fine. Goes for 20 hours marching alongside uh, the soldier. So right now what our soldiers do in, in Afghanistan is, is they carry 100 pounds on their backs as they walk 25 miles to the battlefield. It it's, causes injury, it causes exhaustion, it's a nightmare. But robots are a great idea, except that when you see robots on TV and movies, they always have two feet and walk like people. That happens to be total bull. Like, robots can't do that. It is the hardest engineering problem there is in robotics to have a bipedal robot that walks like a person because we have inner ears, we have senses on our feet, we have eyes, we have all kinds of ways to balance that robots don't have. So this robot right here is an absolutely amazing achievement. For, for 20 years we had walking table robots, that is robots with four legs, but three of them were on the ground at one, any one time. That's not what this guy is doing. This thing is really walking. Is this I mean, the one that gallops? It gallops, that's right. Gallops. This is not its top, top speed. It, it gallops along at, I think it's eight miles an hour um, top speed. So, and you can't really, you can't hear it, but it's deafening. Um, you're not gonna sneak up on the enemy. <laughs> that is not my line, that is a line um, provided by my amazing wife, Nikki, who's here today! And I met her on a Nova shoot, so never say Nova did nothing for me. <laughs> so, um, anyway, um, so we also looked at this incredible, incredible robotic hummingbird, another government project. It has cameras in the eyes. It is the exact size, shape, and flight patterns of a hummingbird. You control it with remote control. If you looked at this thing, you would never guess that that's a robot. No. And you'd be right, that's not a robot. That, <laughs> this is the robot. Um, wow. But it is absolutely identical. In fact, when we were there filming it, um, and by the way, this didn't make the show. Cutting your floor. Um, but when we were there filming it, real hummingbirds were attacking it. Because they thought it was a real intruder. Um, you know, and you ask these guys, these scientists, so what is the function of this military robot? What does the army want with it? And they're like, uh, 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 search and rescue. <laughs> they always tell you search and rescue. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, there's what it looks like with its head off. <laughs> Amazing bit of engineering. Another one that didn't make the show is we actually filmed a guy at, uh, at Harvard who's come up with a bee robot, a bumblebee. It is one thirtieth the weight of a penny. This thing is so tiny, and it flies, and you remote control it. That's astonishing. Yeah. Um, another, not, not all of biomimicry is about robots. These are hagfish. And hagfish are these nasty eels with an amazing defense mechanism. When a predator comes and frightens them, or grabs them, right, they emit enormous quantities of slime. Like many times their body weight worth of slime. And what's really cool about this, this stuff is that the, the eel actually emits only a drop. It's 99% salt water. So this stuff immediately binds with the salt water around it and expands into this grotesque quantity of, of slime. And so if you're the predator, you know, all of a sudden you're more concerned about breathing than eating. You're like, Bleh! You know, it's in your mouth and your gills and... Um, I don't know if you can hear any of this, but this is a piece of the show. So all of this thread pulling is really in anticipation of the day. Can you hear that? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I forgot the, the key point. So what's interesting to scientists is this is filled with tiny, tiny fibers. And it turns out that they are even stronger than the strongest previously known natural fiber, which is spider silk. So by weight, this is stronger than nylon, stronger than spider silk. So what they're talking about is, is trying to synthesize the hagfish proteins to make clothing out of them. If we had clothing made of this stuff, it would never 
fade, it would never tear. Uh, it's not petroleum derived like a lot of. Um, we don't have a speaker, do we? Should we? I can drag these things over here. Um, it takes a second or two. Well, you know, if you can hear it, you can hear it. Okay. Yeah, okay. So all of this thread pulling is really in anticipation of the day Matsuko can synthesize her own hackfish proteins. Here it is. Actual thread made of actual reconstituted fish mucus. Gone <laughs> from the era of hackfish fat. Right there. What would that be like? the long-time Nova viewership, because Nova, how do I put this, it's not known for its comedy, okay? And Nova is a very serious show, and a lot of people like their science straight, they like it not contaminated. Um, so it, it raised some eyebrows, but anyway, um, so then I went to Germany, to this amazing, amazing company called Festo. You've never heard of it probably, but Festo makes the world's leading industrial robots. Festo robots make iPhones, Samsung Galaxy products, cars, they make the robots that make the stuff we use every day. And their headquarters in Germany is like a Willy Wonka land. It's just unbelievable. Everywhere you look, there are these <gasps> guys munching the grass, solar-powered robotic lawnmowers. The entrance to the facility is a, is a pneumatic tube that inflates and deflates. I mean, everything is, is cool and crazy. They're, they they got their start in pneumatics, so they're all about air pressure. <laughs> Happy to see you. Oh, oh please. <laughs> and what happens when you try to drive to them? <laughs> <laughs> Not much. <laughs> try to crash the gate. <laughs> so every year as a demonstration, Festo, who, which special... Oh, oh look, yeah, this, look at their campus. It's like some futuristic sci-fi movie from the 70s. Um, the, uh, every year as an exercise, they, they take their biomimicry team and they imitate some animal to seal its engineering just as a demo. This is their air jellyfish. The entire thing, it's powered by he held off by helium, the entire thing weighs two pounds. And um, the, uh, the, the, control, the thing that steers it is this ball here. You have a remote control that just tips the ball, and that shifts the center of gravity. That's how you steer this thing. Um, this is their seagull. Incredible. Life-size seagull, remote control. And it flies using the actual aerodynamic properties of a seagull. It coasts, it dives, it glides. Um, amazing. So um, anyway, and then the, the, none of that is in the show. None of those cool robots are in the show. The, the part you will see is how they uh, took a, a, an elephant's trunk. I don't know if you saw my CBS Sunday morning story the day before yesterday, but we, did, we gave a, a special sneak peek of this segment on CBS Sunday morning. They, these guys stole the idea of an elephant's trunk, 40,000 muscles and no bones, um, to make a robot for in, uh, assembly lines that you can work next to. You don't dare work next to a regular industrial robot. It'll kill you. But this thing is soft. It's soft, gentle plastic, and more heat. So making stuff colder is a really cool structure. It starts at body temperature and proceeds down through the episode toward absolute zero. Um, this is a question that you guys will probably know the answer to. And nobody else usually does. Where in the universe can you find absolute zero? Only on Earth. You are correct. <laughs> Basically nowhere on Earth. We've gotten to a few millionths of a degree above absolute zero, but nowhere in the universe, which I thought was kind of wild. So we started uh, in Fairbanks, Alaska, which is about as close as absolute zero as I care to get. Um, it was miserably cold. Everything there revolves around snow and ice. I mean, this is their fun fair for the kids. So everything is made of ice. The maze, the, the kitty slides, I mean, everything. There are all these ice carving contests. And dudes, when it gets winter here, you're proud of yourself for making a snowman 
Look at what these guys come up with. <laughs> I mean, come on! <laughs> Look at this! Look at this! I mean, how do you... Anyway, they're amazing. <laughs> Grizzly bear. I tried my hand at it. At it. That was okay. I did alright. <laughs> that was pretty good. So, I'm just kidding. They hired a Chinese guy to do that. <laughs> yeah, all those sculptors are Chinese and Russian. All of them. So... The reason we were there, the story, is about this problem. All the buildings in Alaska, Fairbanks especially, are collapsing into the earth. They're <coughs> coming off their foundations, they're tipping, they're sliding. Look at that. You will love, I interviewed the, the lady who lives here. She was awesome. She, I was like, so did this happen sort of gradually or all at once? And she's like, what the hell do you think? You know, she's like, okay. And I'm like... Was it, was it like uh, one day you noticed your cup of coffee sliding across the table? <laughs> what would you do if your table tipped? It put something under the leg! That's what I did! Like, okay, is there anyone else here we could interview? <laughs> um, so the reason this is happening is because the permafrost is melting. Permafrost is defined as earth that is frozen solid for two years or more. So the water dissolved in the dirt is the cement that holds the dirt together. And as global warming melts the earth, the water runs out of the, of the earth and it softens and collapses. And that's what's happening. The roads are all buckled there. Um, the telephone poles are all crooked. And these houses are collapsing. So this guy came up with the most amazing solution. This is a, a tiny model of his invention. It's called a thermosiphon. And basically, there's a vacuum in this tube, and there's some carbon dioxide in it. Now, I don't know if you know this, but you know how you go higher up on a mountain? When the air pressure is lower, um, it's easier to boil something. Things boil at a lower temperature. Well, when there's a vacuum, you can boil water with the heat from your hand. So if, if you put water in here, and I put my hand on the bottom, the water boils. It's unbelievable. Um, so in this model, it's water. The water boils, turns to a vapor, goes up here to the copper. He's made it cold up here. This is representing the air. This part is underground. This part is above ground. It comes up here, releases the heat to the air, gets cold, turns back into water, and drops to the bottom again. Now, imagine that on a much bigger scale, using carbon dioxide as the material rather than water. And that is a thermosiphon. So it is a. It requires no power, no maintenance, all day long. It's funneling heat out of the earth into the air, restoring the, the liquid back to the bottom. Cycles up over and over and over again, quietly all summer long. Amazing. So this is the federal building in Fairbanks. It's been there for ten years. These thermosiphons go down under the earth and make a right turn and go under the building. They keep the ground frozen solid year round no power, whereas all around the houses are tipping and tapping. So how expensive is it to, to use that? They're, they're cheap. I mean, they're cheap. They're a pipe. They're a vacuum pipe with some carbon dioxide in it, and that's it. How deep are they? Um, it goes under the building. Um, so it's not like a... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but not deep. It's just, it, it goes down and then under. Hmm. Hmm. So there's another structure in Alaska that you might care about not sinking into the earth. The pipeline. Now you know what those things are. 624,000 thermosiphons all along the pipeline, sucking heat out of the earth. Who's making them? This one guy's company. He's a genius. Yeah, the United States. He's a freaking genius. I mean, what a simple elegant. I love this. We also went to Paris to talk about maglev properties. So magnetic levitation is when you have um, strong magnets. The, tr the track is made of strong magnets. And then, like the, yeah. <laughs> and then in the surfboard here, they pour liquid nitrogen. <laughs> and they're going to turn the, sur the surfboard into a superconductor. And as you know, when a superconductor and magnets get together, they lock. It's not like magnets repelling, because uh, the magnets and the superconductor would remain in that orientation even if you turn them upside down. 
It's repelling and attracting at the same time. They are frozen in this levitating relationship. So they use this to make this maglev surfboard. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the future. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, our, our production system is much more graceful with it. Yeah. It's like bumpy. No, it's not. It's not bumpy at all. Anyway, um, so as you know, Japan is building a maglev train like that. It will go 320 miles an hour without fight because there's no friction. Like you just give it a push at the first station and it just wow. goes forever. Um, in Colder, we talked about this common Connecticut wood frog, which has a unique ability. Every winter, whereas most animals either go south or hibernate or do something else to keep warm, it just fr freezes solid into this piece of ice. And I did this. I held this frog. It was like, I mean, you could play hacky sack with it. It was like this brick. It was like this complete, there's no brain activity, no muscle movement, no blood, no breathing, nothing. It's just completely inanimate. And then in the springtime, it thaws out over the course of a day and hops away. Every winter. Is that bizarre? And it works that way because it is filled with antifreeze. Its, its blood has these chemicals in it. So anyone who's seen sci-fi movies would then say, well, wait a minute. We always see people in suspended animation in you know, sci-fi space movies. Could we do that too? And the answer is no, we couldn't because the antifreeze chemicals are toxic. It would kill us instantly. But that doesn't stop this company. <laughs> yes. This is the company where you pay $200,000 for the right to be frozen forever in one of these tanks. There are 117 people in those chambers, and that's including the seven people in each. And these two who have opted for the budget option, heads only. Oh, no. Those are heads only, including Ted Williams. Of all the I like it matters. I like, like really. I mean, <laughs> yeah, real. Exactly. And so I said, and so this is this is the CEO, and he's also a client. <laughs> He's right. also signed up. And I'm like, dude, seriously, I mean, have you ever thawed anyone out? And he said, well, well no. He's British. And he says, but look at it this way, mate. I've got 1% chance that in 500 years, they'll be able to revive me and cure whatever killed me. What chance have you got? <laughs> How does he figure 1%? And like, uh, do you take visa? Um, <laughs> so this story did not make the show. It won't be in the show. And I'm, I said to the producer, oh, come on, that was kind of cool. What, what's wrong with it? And he goes, it's a science show. <laughs> this, is, this is not science, as Dan so is stupid, sir. Um, <laughs> this is uh, the highlight, or the low light of the colder episode. Um, in 2006, there were these army rangers on a routine training mission in a swamp in Florida. It was 60 degrees. And four of these guys died of hypothermia. 60 degrees in Florida? What the heck? So the military said, we have to investigate this. We have to figure out what happened there. So they built this $25 million facility in Natick, Massachusetts. They can recreate any kind of environmental conditions in this chamber. It can go up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit down to minus 40 Fahrenheit. They can control the humidity, the air pressure. They can make it rain. They can make the wind blow. Anything they want. So on day one, they hooked me up with 50 pounds of gear, full body armor, heated it to 104, and asked me to walk on the treadmill for two hours with a rectal thermometer. <laughs> yeah. That explains the look on your face. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't fun. <laughs> and to my astonishment, $25 million apparently does not buy you a cordless model. <laughs> That's what she's holding. <laughs> I hope they pay you a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they will too someday. Um, now, when they have soldiers do this, they they're, it's a volunteer basis, and they give them hazard pay. But nope, it's part of the job. But that, ladies and gentlemen, that was a walk in the park next to day two.
Day two, they chilled the room to 39 degrees, and they had me stand in the rain. The water was ice water. It was chilled also to 39 degrees. I had to stand there with the freaking thermometer uh, for 10 minutes until I was completely soaked, and that's when they turned on the wind. 15 miles an hour, steady, constant, not like a breeze that ebbs and flows, perpetual, and back on the treadmill I went soaking wet for half an hour. This is the producer whose idea this was, they're going to find him dead. Um, after half an hour the water had just started to dry, so I had to go back in the shower for another 10 minutes of rain, ice rain, and then back on the treadmill. The original idea was for me to do this rotation six times. By the end of the second two cycles, I, I couldn't speak. I was shaking uncontrollably. And he said, all right, back into the rain again. And I'm like, how will it look any different from the second time? <laughs> so they, they let me quit. But this is, this is the thermal image of me. You can see that my core and my brain are practically ice. I mean, my body temperature well, my body temperature actually only dropped to 95 degrees, but that, that alone is a serious blow to the system. He says that when you stay on for six hours, you can go way down. You can go to like 86 degrees inside you, a body that's supposed to be 98.6. So that one is in the colder episode. Uh, this one is not. <laughs> this one, I just, I just can't stop laughing. So uh, in turn, we went to Austria. And in Austria, they have a lot of skiing. And the ski resorts are often built on glaciers, and the glaciers are melting. Global warming is thawing the ice that holds the ski lift posts in place. So the ski lift poles are starting to do this. And they have to save the ski resort to save the industry. So they've tried all kinds of things. They've tried pumping antifreeze into the ground. I mean, um, freezing stuff into the ground. They've tried spraying water on when it's cold, hoping it'll build up the ice. Nothing works until they decided to cover the ground with blankets. They cover the mountain with white blankets. It reflects the sun and insulates the, the cold, cold of the earth, and it keeps these poles from tipping because the ground stays frozen through the winter. Great! So we thought it'd be really cool to go to Austria. I'm an intermediate skier. We thought it'd be a cool opening shot. Here I am skiing down this mountain at this ski resort. And the cam I ski by the camera, and he pans over there, and there are all these blankets. What a great segment. <laughs> so we land in Munich, and we're at the rental car <laughs> station to get our car to drive to. This is near Innsbruck. And um, they said, and where are you going? And we're like, we're going to Innsbruck. And she goes, <laughs> no, you are not. <laughs> like, why not? And she goes, and you have not heard of the 100-year flood? <laughs> we landed during the 100-year flood of Innsbruck. Our ski resort was completely cut off. The ro all roads were flooded, the bridges were out, no one was getting in or out. So there was no way to shoot there. Worse, our scientist was on the wrong side of the floodwaters. She couldn't get to us either. So we had no scientists, we had no ski resort, and the third thing we needed, which we had shipped in, was our infrared thermal camera, which we're going to show the effect of these blankets that wouldn't reach us either. So, no camera, no scientist, no ski resort. But does that stop Nova? Never! <laughs> On the phone they get, they line up another ski resort that has blankets. There's just a couple of hitches. This ski resort has not yet opened for the season. The slopes are ungroomed, there's nobody there. And the blankets have not been put out yet. <laughs> Those are the blankets. That's our shot, folks. So, we're like, okay, could you... Could you uh, pull a couple of them out and show us how you unroll them? Okay, roll, roll the camera. And so we're like, all right, here we go. This is our, this is our segment. The scientists sent a grad student to do the interview. There she is. She's like, I don't understand what we are doing here. This is silly. I can't see anything. And then, so we did the segment. This is the same producer, who, by the way, who put me through that miserable military center. He deserves every bit of misery he's experiencing it. Um, and so we're all just trying to figure out how we're going to make a story out of this. And they said, okay, well, at least let's get the opening shot. Why don't we have you and Ava here, why don't we have you two ski down the mountain together, and we'll film that from the top of the mountain. So I get on my skis, and we shuffle off to the top of the slope. It has never been groomed, it has never been skied on, it is this deep, and it is 
50 degrees. It is like the consistency of tapioca pudding. I mean, I, 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 literally, I literally went like this. <laughs> I could not ski on this. Meanwhile, Ava is like, shh, 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 like she's gone, you know. Meanwhile, how do you like the conditions? Whiteout blizzard. You couldn't see anything. So in five seconds, she was gone. Like, Ava! Ava! And I, I, I would climb out, you know, I'd climb back up and try to put my ski on top of the snow and just go, you know, there's just, you couldn't do it. It was the most miserable experience. So finally, she, she sidesteps back up the mountain to me. He's like, David, you must ski fast or you will sink. I'm like, I know that, but I don't even know which way is downhill. It was horrible. Two and a half hours. And meanwhile, they didn't get the shot. They can't film through that. They couldn't see us. So I get to the bottom, two hours later, I look like this. It's <laughs> <laughs> the miserable experience of mine. And this, these are my legs. Oh, <laughs> oh, just my ouch. Horrible. So that one's not in the show either. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, the one compensation we got to fly home on Iceland Airlines. Mm -hmm. And we literally flew over Iceland. It was magnificent. That's just oh. taken out the plane window. So making stuff faster, of course, covers the... Uh, World's fastest sailboat. I got to ride on the America's Cup boat, which is incredible. Oh, um, this is the one that's on tomorrow night. You have to watch this. this is, if you have children, you have to watch this. World's fastest sailboat. World's fastest bike. We went to um, Holland. This guy built a bike, and he can ride it at 83 miles an hour. Human powered bike. It's a recumbent bike in a carbon fiber carbon fiber fuselage. So there's no air resistance at all. It goes so fast. But we also looked at the speed of boarding an airplane. This might be my favorite story of all, maybe because I live on airplanes. Um, it turns out that the way we board airplanes now, mathematically speaking, is the worst, slowest way to board an airplane. You board from the back. What that means is that every time somebody interrupts the flow to put something in the overhead bin, the entire process shuts down for that one person times 150 people doing that. It also means that once you're in your seats, you might be in the aisle or the middle seat. So when the window guy gets there, everybody has to get up, get out, block the aisle while the window seat gets there. Over and over and over. It's a mess. So Southwest Airlines has a unique proposition. They say open seating. Take any seat you want. And whereas the average plane boards in 20 minutes, um, Southwest boards in 11 minutes, and that's because of human nature. You instinctively take the window seats, mm -hmm. and once you're in the window seat, you're not going to get up again. You're not going to block the aisle or have to have someone climb over you. And then the next wave takes the aisle seats, and there might be a few middle coming later. But there's this physicist named Jason Steffen who got a lot of attention in the New York Times a couple years ago when he ran all these simulations and came up with a method that he says would cut Southwest time in half. It's a very complicated theoretical method which, which every, every single person gets a boarding sequence number, like your number 13, your number 14. Everyone goes on the plane, left side, I, uh, window seats, alternate rows. Then right side, window seats, alternate rows. Then middles, middles, then aisles, aisles. So that does two things. One, it means you've got 30 people putting stuff in the overhead bin in parallel, all the way down the aisle, all at once. Secondly, no one ever climbs over anyone. No one ever has to get up to let someone in. But it had never been tried. So Nova called Southwest and said, you guys say you have the fastest boarding in the industry. We think we have a guy who can do it faster. And to their great credit, Southwest said, bring it on. They gave us a plane. <laughs> and they gave us 150 employees. And we tested it. We had a race. An unbelievable... Look at it. We put GoPro cameras everywhere in the cabin, in the overheads, even on the flight attendant's head. That's wild. It was so great. I love this segment so dearly. And um, should I tell you who won? Or should I make you watch the show? We're going to watch the show. Oh, you watch the show anyway. anyway. Anyway, the physicist won. Seven and a half minutes. Wow. wow. Incredible. Incredible. And yet, it's one of, those victories, one of those victories with a footnote. Because you will never see this method used. The problem is, two problems. First of all, you know Americans. You can't pee.
people get people to board the plane in exact numerical sequence. Is that what? Lufthansa. Lufthansa does it? No, but that they would. Oh, they would, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they would. And the second problem is, because you're getting all the window seat people first, and then the middle seat, you're splitting up groups. So, can you see the mom, you know, telling her four-year-old, now, I, I'm taking my window seat, and when the nice man says middle seats, you come on the plane, honey. You wait here, you know, like, it would never work. So, it's a theoretical victory, but really cool. Um, so this is my great America's Cup adventure. America's Cup boats do not, they're not sailboats. This is, this thing looks like an airplane wing. That's the sail. It is an airplane wing. It's rigid, it's carbon fiber, it's an airfoil. It has flaps and airlines. It's just an airplane wing like this. And that is why these carbon fiber, $100 million boats go so darn fast. They're the fastest boats ever, sailboats ever built. 50 miles an hour. And um, they're also very fragile. Um, in March, the Swiss, the Swedish boat, their, their catamaran, the Swedish boat, snapped and collapsed, and one of the sailors died. So by the time I got there, the number of people, outsiders, were allowed to go on these boats was very restricted. So we were super lucky. But what's really cool about these boats is this puppy. Look at that. It is a strut. When you hit 20 miles an hour, they lower the strut into the water. At the bottom of it is an airplane wing. It's only six feet wide. It's this wide, under the water. So this strut goes down and in, in an airplane wing. And when it hits 20 miles an hour, there's enough Bernoulli effect, there's enough lift over that wing to lift the entire six-ton boat out of the water. Wow. It's riding on that. This is the rudder. That's not supporting it. It's all on this one stick. It's incredible. There's another one on this side for when it's going in the opposite direction, but only one is in the water at a time. And the idea, of course, is to reduce drag. The two things that slow a sailboat down are wind resistance and water resistance. So they use this wing instead of a sail for wind resistance, and they eliminate water resistance by getting the boat out of the water. It is the most incredible thing. When it, That first time when I was on, it was like a magic carpet on steroids. It's just like, oh my god, we're playing! It was really cool. Wow. And each one of those is $100 million? $100 million a team, yep. Wow. It's Oracle. Between the boat and, you know, the support staff. We, we pay Oracle again. We, we filmed this in May, and of course the actual America's Cup was, in, was last month, in September. And um, of course we had no idea if we were going to win. So we were really, like, the whole time, we're like, this show could be so lame. <laughs> you know, like, oh, this technology, this cool airfoil thing, and we get in third. <laughs> you know, it would just be lame. But we were down 8-1 well, to one against New Zealand, yeah. and America won the next eight races in a row Phenomenal. to win the America's Cup. Phenomenal. Well, the boats yeah, have the same technology? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they're all the same design, but there are a million minor modifications that you can make. And indeed... Our team is said to have won by making these modifications every night. After the race, they would go back in, they, they hauled the boat out of the water every single night, after every ride, and then they would make tiny modifications to the, to the carbon. Um, making stuff safer, I thought was gonna be a fairly boring show. Uh, I could not have been wronger. Um, this is the uh, self-driving race car. There's no one in there. It goes 120 miles an hour. It is not remote controlled. It is not on a slotted track. Um, it's an experiment to develop new safety technologies for regular cars. They figure if a car can drive safely at 120 miles an hour on this curving, vicious, twisting track, then it should be a piece of cake to, to bring it to ordinary cars. This is how it works. It's, it's basically assisted GPS. So this is massive GPS um, assisted by, but the, the thing knows where it is to within a centimeter. So they've enhanced the GPS. And then the idea is, how do they teach this thing to drive so well? Well, they put professional race car drivers in this vehicle. This is a very strange research vehicle. Um, I was wired up with the EEG brainwave monitors. And that's what they do. They take professional drivers and put them around this car. <coughs> she, the research assistant, is controlling each of the four wheels. She can make the car spin out at any time. So I'm trying to go around these cones, and she's going, mm -hmm, that's right. <laughs> you know, and I'm going, 
and not trying to straighten it out, and their computer is, is storing what I'm doing. So they try to reproduce what these professional drivers do in, in stressful, out of control situations and reduce it to software that the racing car can then implement. And a lot of people say, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want computer driven cars, I don't want those on my roads. And, you know, my answer is, you know what, I don't want you on my roads. 95% <laughs> of accidents are human error. So let's take the human out of it, I say. Google's cars have racked up hundreds of thousands of miles of driving on California roads without a single accident. Completely amazing. At the end, they had a race. So I drove the car myself uh, around the two and a half mile track. They got a professional racer to drive it, and then they had the car drive itself. And to everybody's surprise, the professional race car driver won by two seconds. And second place was the car. <laughs> and then I was like 30 seconds behind that. <laughs> they, uh, they love trying to kill me on camera. So for making stuff safer, uh, they also, you know, <laughs> had my apartment burn up. And the story here is that a firefighter, if you use water on a wall, you have to stand there for a long time because the water just runs down. You have to, it takes five minutes to put the fire out. So if you use foam, foam snuffs the fire out, but it's toxic. So it gets into the water table, it kills fish, and then we eat that stuff and it's, it's not good. So this guy has invented a cornstarch mixture. He installs this tank of cornstarch in the fire truck and it's mixed in real time with the water as it comes through the hose. And it behaves like foam, but it's totally non-toxic. I got to then dress up as a firefighter and spray the cornstarch water on the fire. That's, that's me in the middle doing absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> but it really worked to put the fire out, and it's very cool. And then the very last thing, um, this is wild. The show also tackles terrorism. Um, those of you who know me, um, or Nikki, knows that I have a thing about the TSA. Okay, they make me so crazy with their <laughs> idiotic. I mean, I mean, dude, I'm sorry. If I wanted to blow up your plane, it would be so easy. Right. In the meanwhile, you're inconveniencing everybody in stupid ways. I mean, the truth is, if you wanted to prevent another 9/11, all you had to do is armor the cockpit doors, which they've done. They did it on day one. Now, no one can ever take over the plane. We're done. We don't need to take off our shoes and our underwear. Furthermore, <laughs> furthermore, how many people can you kill in a plane? 120? Meanwhile, who's watching Madison Square Garden, or a Broadway theater, or Grand Central, or the subway, or a baseball game where you can kill 50,000 people? It's like, guys, 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 this is all so stupid. Security Sorry, I'm theater. not theater. Security yeah. theater. Security theater. That's all it is. And, and like, the liquids? Oh, okay. Three ounces per bottle, and I can't bring two friends with me who will pool their three ounces with mine? I mean, it's just so dumb. Anyway, um, meanwhile, here's another problem. These are containers, 60 million of those things, coming into the United States every year from other countries. How many of them are inspected? Less than half a percent. And how are they inspected? With an x-ray. The x-ray, everybody clears the area, the truck driver gets out of the truck, the x-ray blasts sideways through the container. So if you've got uranium or a nuke or a dirty bomb in there, how hard is it to hide it from the x-ray? You put a piece of lead in front of your nuke and you can't see it. Those things are basically uninspected. So these guys in California have come up with the most amazing solution. This is a muon scanner. Now, atoms are coming into our atmosphere from outer space by the millions all the time. When they hit the atmosphere, many of them break up into subatomic <coughs> particles, one of which is called a muon. Muons are very dense. They travel at the speed of light. They go through anything, concrete, lead, steel, air, water, and you. You have 5,000 muons a minute passing through your body. And it doesn't bother you. It's completely safe and normal. So, what they've done is, these aluminum tubes, each one has a wire going through it that detects muons passing the wire. <coughs> An identical set is underneath the container. So what these guys can do, the muons raining in from outer space come through here. They are deflected according to the density of what's in the truck. And they measure the deflection 
and the rate change of those muons, and they can see a picture of what's inside the truck. It's absolutely incredible. And there's no energy, there's no power. You don't have to beam anything through the truck. Nature is beaming it for us with these totally safe particles. And so they, they did a test. This is actually uranium. This is a cube of depleted uranium. It won't kill me by being near it for a few minutes, but it's still extremely radioactive. Um, and this is a milk crate with three layers, one inch thick layers of lead. So they had me put on gloves, put the cube into the lead, put the top on, and try to hide it in the truck from their scanner. The truck was filled with piles of uh, kitty litter and bottled water and office paper that were in the middle of being shipped. And then the guy turned on the scanner, he saw everything in there. This was before I put the uranium in there. The uranium showed up, I hid it in the office paper, it showed up as a big red square, and the operator doesn't even have to be trained because the software goes eh, 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 like right there. Um, it takes 30 seconds to scan the truck, and that's about how long it takes the truck driver to fill out his paperwork, like where he's going and what's in the truck. And they have this up and running in the Bahamas at Freeport. They, they do three trucks side by side, all at once. Three trucks can pull in. And I asked the guy, could we not use this in airports to scan us? And he said, well, you could, but remember, it takes 30 seconds for a scan, so you'd have to have, have people sit still. But what you could do is scan the entire plane full at once. Like you could like have everyone sit here in the waiting lounge, you go, everyone sit still for a second, and then get on the plane. Why, why couldn't you do that with the ship? One scan before it gets off the boat. You, well, you could, but... And then you know you have a problem. But they, but they need something above and below the container. That'd be huge. Yeah, so you mean like put an underwater thing below the ship? I, I didn't think it out. Yeah. <laughs> I admire your honesty, sir. <laughs> so anyway, so those are four, the four episodes, and, and they're just, as you can tell, they're just so cool. These producers are the best science producers in the world. It's a very rarefied group. They have to find the stories, find the scientists. We only get scientists who know how to talk, who are you know, interesting and speak English. Um, it's, a, it's a rarefied group, and these guys have done an incredible job. As you may have noticed, this time we were not limited to material science. So making stuff too is not about material science, it's about any darn science we want. So the stories are absolutely incredible. Um, at the same time, there is a price to making these shows. And one of them is NOVA is constantly on the verge of not having the money to do them. We've just learned that the National Science Foundation, which funded these two series, is now out of the business of funding television projects. Whoa. They will not fund any more TV. Hmm. So NOVA's like, great, what now? So there will be no making stuff free next year. It'll take much longer to, to scrape the money together. The Cook brothers are big benefactors of it. They are. Which is kind of crazy. Which is kind of crazy. Are. I know. Yeah. People say that to me all the time. How can you make a show that's funded by David Koch? And right. I'm like, well, you know, he has no editorial control. He doesn't see what we're making. Uh, it's blood money, but should we not do the show? <laughs> it is blood money. Yeah, exactly. Um, and meanwhile, you get people not liking the style. This is typical. David, your Riley books are great, your New York Times article is great, your PBS program is great, but your humor is just so bad I have to let you know. Try watching as if you're not you. I don't know that. And meanwhile, the travel burden is insane. I have three phenomenal kids. This was my travel schedule for the shoots. Wow. So when you see a white square, that's when I saw my kids and when I saw Nathan. <laughs> you know, it was really, bad, really bad. So, um, so you have to ask: Is it all worth it? The money and the snipers and the schedule. And then you get an email like this: My seven-year-old daughter Eva may be one of your biggest fans. Last spring, she got hooked on making stuff. We had to buy the DVD, and we've watched episodes often several times a week for the entire year. Today we found out you'd be visiting our home state of Oklahoma. And for five hours she talked about nothing but science elements and getting your autograph. It would be a highlight of her life. So why do we go to all that trouble? Why is it worth it? This is why. She carries the, the DVD around like most kids would carry a teddy bear. She clutches it. So anyways, there's, there's a little uh, return of the nine non-scientists for you. They start tomorrow night. And... Uh, those are the four episodes, and 
Do you have any questions? Be happy to answer, or we could just go look at the med. So what do you think is the future, since you're not going to get funding? What, what, what are they going to do? So what they do now is they, a lot of what's on NOVA is like uh, bought from the BBC, pre-made stuff that they didn't make. Um, they, I mean, they won't be able to make any more of these shows. These shows are, they're like, each one is like a movie. I mean, they're, they're, they, they hire a, a, a composer right. to write music, an hour of music. It's nonstop music, like a movie for each show. Um, and the you know, as you saw, we went all over the world and stuff like that. So I'm not, I'm not sure they could do it cheaply. Um, but even then, the government, the, the National Science Foundation was um, probably gave us half the money we needed for these. So they would have to get half from rich people or endowments and things like that. It's touch and go every year. Why did they pull the plug? You know, that's a really great question. There's, um, there's for sure an anti-science wave in this country right now. Uh, science is considered elitist and snobby and anti-religion. Um, so you have the, the middle of the country, uh, you know, the, the evolution deniers and so on, um, who don't like uh, seeing our money spent. And, you know, Republican government, uh, 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 people of recent, congressmen recently have been, since the Bush years, have been sort of anti-science, like, you know, no stem cells and, and so on. Um, Obama was supposed to bring science back into the public sphere, and he was going to fund more science projects and hire science teachers, and he's been uh, stopped every single time. They always die in Congress. So I think that's just, it's just a zeitgeist thing. Do you know where the viewership is? Do they know that much about it? Is it East Coast, West Coast, and nothing in between? Wow. I know the numbers and I know the ages, but I don't know the geographies. That's really interesting. I don't know. It, is it a blue state, red state kind of a thing? I mean, the viewership? Yeah. You know, I would bet that it is, but I, I don't know. I What's the age? Seen it. So the amazing thing is that these shows have lowered the ages of science viewership um, from you're not going to like this, but from an average NOAA, NOVA viewer age of 61 ooh, down to 57. <laughs> that's a big bell curve. That's a lot of younger people lowering the average. And an incredible number of really young people. I mean, my God, the emails I get from children who watch these shows is staggering to me. I mean, just, and, and, and she's not, that little girl's not the only one. There's People who watch, little kids all over the country watching these shows over and over and over. Um, I've had four emails, I'm happy to say four emails, in this country, which ranks 25th internationally in science scores. I've had four emails from college kids who said that after having seen these shows, they have changed their majors. Oh, nice. Maybe those are just the ones who bother to write. Maybe what you have to do is uh, coordinate with places like Khan Academy. Yeah. Khan Academy is amazing, isn't it? It is amazing. And, and these shows are, to be sure, used in classrooms all over the place. Part of the NSF's grant uh, insisted that there be accompanying teacher material. So for every one of these shows, there's this really cool classroom kit. It's free, and NOVA is the number one used video resource in high schools all over the country. So, um, so they are used all the time in for education. Have you contacted the Westport High School? Yes, I've spoken there. I've given this presentation for yeah. Westport yeah. science classes yeah. and um, hope to go to my third graders classroom next week too. Yeah. Because some of these stories, you know, I mean, you can understand yeah. if you're a little kid. Um, yeah, they've been, they've been super gracious. <coughs> um, anyway, well, thank you so much for your... Thank you.